Okay, now what are we talking about when I say quasi one dimensional flow? I don't know. Okay, I, I, I do know, I do know. So 1D flow, let's do that one first. And we'll put quasi over here. Perfect. So a 1D flow is pretty simple. I have a tube, looks like this. Beautiful. And you can see that the area of that tube is a constant. And then for that flow, I simply say that my pressure, my density, my temperature, my velocity, these are all simply a function of x, okay? They are not a function of y. What I am simply saying is that if I do my velocity here, that is pretty much the same as my velocity there. So long as these are taken at the same distance x. So that's what I'm getting at there. Properties don't change as I go away. They only change as I go down the tube. Quasi-1D is slightly different. So here's a quasi-1D tube. Ooh. Now you can already see that's slightly different because its area changes. So area is no longer a constant, but it's a function of x. And everything else, well, pressure, density, temperature, velocity, all of these are also still a function of x. So even though we have that change in area, we're still saying that my properties only depend on how far I've gone down in the x direction, not in the y direction. So that is quasi one dimensional flow. That's what it means as I go into this. It's not really one dimensional because like it does have, you know, it does change, but the changes in properties from the top to the bottom are so tiny that it really doesn't affect as much. Now let's work on developing our equations for this quasi one dimensional flow. Now, like we've done in the past, I'm going to draw a control surface. So I'm going to do this, you know, in a 2D picture. Here we go. That looks good. And so I have some flow coming out. I have some flow going in. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you that nothing's going through this because this is a nozzle. Sorry, this is a diffuser. Actually, that depends on if it's supersonic or supersonic. It's something. There we go. And so this is my control volume right here inside. I do have a control surface. And remember that ds always points away from the surface. That's ds right there. And so I would have some sort of velocity, u2, a density, a pressure. Forgot to add a little tail. There we go. And temperature, area, all that stuff. And I have the same on the other side. So, velocity. It looks more like an N than a U. I'll try rewriting it. Velocity. There we go. Density, pressure, temperature, and area. Okay, so just like we did for. Um, shock waves and for expansion fans, we're going to develop our equations, our continuity equations, our conservation equations for these nozzle and diffuser flows. So first off, let's stick with continuity. Now I'm not going to bother drawing out the full form every single time. Um, we're just going to focus on what it means. So continuity is simply saying that my mass flow in has to be equal to my mass flow out. Okay, mass flow in is going to be equal to my mass flow out. Why? Because this is steady. 
we have flow that's going through here and we're assuming that it's steady, that means there's no change in the amount of mass in this section with time. So if it's steady, all of our DDTs are equal to zero. So, well, what is mass flow equal to? Well, mass flow is equal to density times my volume flow rate. And if you didn't know what that volume flow rate is, volume flow rate is simply equal to your area times your velocity, which I'm using u for velocity because I did that earlier. So what this tells me is that I have rho in, area in, u in, is equal to rho out, area out, velocity out. Or if I put that in terms of what I had earlier, it would simply be, and making it like your textbook, rho 1 u1 one, a1 one, is equal to rho 2 u2 two, a2. Two. There we go. That looks pretty good. So this one's pretty simple. We've seen this pretty much every single time, and it works out nice because all of our flows have been steady so far, and so we've always had this same exact form. For shock waves, it's steady. For expansion fans, it's steady. For these flows going through nozzles and diffusers, it's steady. So we keep on getting the same continuity equation. Now, where things tend to change on us is when we get to our conservation of momentum or conservation of energy. So let's go ahead and work on conservation of momentum now. Okay. So first off, the big scary equation. I say big, we're writing in this, this abbreviated form. So the surface integral of density, once again, I gotta add that little tail, eh, times the velocity dot ds, there we go, times the velocity, beautiful. It's gonna be equal to negative of my surface integral of the pressure ds. Looks good. Just remember, I do my best that v equals volume and v equals velocity. Why do the textbooks do this to you? I don't know. It's, it's not nice. It's not nice. Okay. Now we can already simplify this a little bit because what we should realize is that we only care about the x direction here. Okay, there is no y direction. So this term, at least, is always in terms of x. And this term will be as well. So any velocities, I'm saying, at least some of the velocities, and all of the other components are going to be in terms of x. So let's go ahead and see that. So I'll rewrite it, once again, doing it in terms of x. And you'll see that this part inside, I can't get rid of that velocity because it's in part of a dot product. But the one on the outside, I can. And so that just turns into u, which is the x component of velocity. That's nice. Now I'll have that's equal to negative, my double integral. Both these are surface integrals. And this one right here, this is simply be equal to the pressure times ds, and that's simply gonna be in the x direction. Okay, that did simplify it a little bit, okay? It simplified it a little bit, but not 100% there. We gotta figure this out. <sighs> but we can figure this out now. So now let's do the pressure components, okay? We'll do the pressure components here. Because we still got some stuff we gotta do. So when we're evaluating this integral right here, we only have to care about it on two places. Okay? We care about it right here, this will call one, and we care about it right here, this will call two. And this is a one, and this one right here is a two. So these are the only two that actually have any effect. Because the top one is blocked off, nothing can go through it. And the bottom is also blocked off, nothing can go through it. So you're going to say that the pressure there is zero, 
you say the surface is zero, it just very easy think about it, there is no momentum going through those surfaces. So they're not doing anything to this. So I have to then figure out how I'm going to write out this integral, okay? How am I going to write out this integral? Sorry, cracking my neck here. So when I do that, well, first off, let's think about the directions. So ds in this case is going out like that. ds in this case is going out this way. So I'm always going to have negative sign. I've got to do it for both sides. So that will be first I'll do a p1. So it's going to be negative times negative. Yeah, we'll just negative p1 a1 plus negative p2 a2. There we go. That looks right. Now, why do I have a second negative sign and only one on the other side? Remember that I'm doing a dot product there, more or less. I have ds, which is pointing in a negative direction for the first one. I have ds, which is pointing in a positive direction for the second one. So you could say that it's negative in one case and positive in the other. You can also simply remember that if you take the dot product of two unit vectors that are going in opposite directions, you'll get negative one. Okay, so then I do this, what I get is, make sure I do this right, because I'm always going to, yeah, I believe I did it right. I did. Happy days. I'll get P1 A1 minus P2 A2. Okay, so I got this term taken care of. Now I have to take care of this term, which you might think is going to be really, really hard, but it's actually ridiculously easy. Okay, it's just really, really easy. So why is it so easy? What makes it so easy? Well, I want to show you what makes it so easy. So let's write it out and bring it down here. Okay, so we're doing this for both sides. Remember we have a side one and we have a side two. So redrawing this one more time so I can see absolutely everything. On those two sides, I'm going to have still that ds, I'll still have that a1, and ds going this direction, and a2. But I'm also going to have velocities, which are u2 going out, and I'm going to have u1 going in. There we go. That is not too bad. Not too bad. So what I would get then, I do it properly is first for side one so I'll do side one and then I'll do side two I'll put a little note right there so you realize that the same thing here is going to have density one times u one times area one u one looks good I like it and for side two density two u2, a2, and then u2. Okay, that looks pretty good to me. I'm pretty happy with it. And so now we're going to bring those two components together. Because remember, this is on the right-hand side, and this is on the left-hand side. So I'll simplify that a little bit as I go. So I'll get row 1 u1 squared a1 plus rho2 u2 squared a2 is equal to make sure I do it right. Oh, I forgot a negative sign. I knew I was going to forget a negative sign somewhere. I always do that. Sorry. Remember that this ds was going in the negative direction. Which meant I should have had a negative sign right there. There we go. I knew I missed a negative sign somewhere. It's going to be equal to, there we go, p1 a1 minus p2 a2. Now, don't you think it would look nicer if we had all the ones on one side and the twos on another? I think it would. I think it would look much better. So let's go ahead and 
add those in here. So I want to get, make sure I do this right. P1, A1, plus density 1, U1 squared, A1. is equal to P2, A2, plus density 2, U2 squared, A2. Feeling pretty good about that. That looks pretty decent. Okay, and so uh, we are pretty much done. We're pretty much done. But we're not a hundred percent there because we did neglect one little detail here that we should have brought in here. Okay, so in all of our previous times of doing this equation, when I was looking at this part of the integral, so I'm gonna redraw it down here at the bottom. So that negative double integral surface P dA. The big thing was that dA never changed, right? It never changed. It was always the same. So in all of our previous times, this has been a constant. And so a lot of times we would just get rid of the a's at the end. Remember, like we would cancel out area from this equation. We would just have pressure plus rho one u one squared. This time I didn't. Now because it's not a constant in this case, we actually have to include one more detail which is simply that there is an integral of P dA. So that's simply saying that as I go from A1 to A2, that pressure is going to be pushing on the walls and the walls are gonna be pushing on it more or less and causing more acceleration. So this is another term I have to add on here to correct for that. So with that, I finally get my last little equation here, which is P1 A1 plus rho 1 u1 squared a1 is equal to p2 a2 plus rho 2 u2 squared a2 plus the integral from a1 to a2 of p dA. So this is pretty much the walls. Okay, this is the effect of the walls. They do have an effect. And if I had to like, you know, explain it in strange ways, that is where your rocket ship is being pushed. The walls are. Like, honestly, the walls are what's being pushed by the air. You know, you have to think about, like, why is it moving forward? The walls are getting pushed by the air. And that's the effect you can see right there. Okay, so this one here is conservation of momentum. We got one more to do, and then we'll be good here. And while I can completely derive your conservation of energy equation, we're reaching the same exact conclusion we've had a bunch of times before. So I'm not going to worry about it too much. Just know that once again, H0 is equal to a constant. So our stagnation enthalpy is a constant, which means that our stagnation temperature is also equal to a constant, which helps us out a lot. If you want that written out in the nice form, you can get that H1 plus U1 squared over 2 is equal to H2 plus U2 squared over 2. And that will give it all to us. We'll have the stagnation pressure and the stagnation enthalpy are constant. And those, those are our equations. So we got them written out. Nice.